Well, this is it. We've covered the beloved Resistance Fall of Man. We've covered the love it or hate it Resistance 2. It's time to conclude the main series and talk about Resistance 3. To those of you who are new to the channel, yes, that means you've got some catching up to do. So click the link in the top right corner or go in the description to go and watch the rest of the Resistance retrospectives. Now once again, like with Resistance 2, a lot of my nostalgia towards Resistance 3 was that multiplayer component. I just adored the series multiplayer, it was where I got my multiplayer fix on PlayStation devices. I say devices because I played the crap out of Resistance Retribution's multiplayer on the PSP as well. Obviously, I can't test out Resistance 3's multiplayer today, as has been the case with the previous entries. But we can see how Insomniac decided to conclude the series seemingly for good. Well, maybe, who knows anymore. Resistance 3 released in September 2011 and critically was a big hit with both critics and fans alike. This did not equate to more sales though. In fact, during Resistance 3's first month, the game sold roughly 180,000 copies, which granted is more than Resistance Fall of Man, when nobody really had a PS3, but well below Resistance 2 at 385,000 copies, and later was made to look just plain sad, as Gears of War 3 would release the same month and sold over 3 million copies in a week. I'm quite puzzled as to why Resistance 3 sold so poorly. September 2011 wasn't a packed month by any means, and in terms of PS3 games, there definitely wasn't a ton of competition. I'm not sure what went wrong here, and this honestly shocked me when I learnt this information. But all I can really say is, I think a lot of people missed out with this one. I remember Resistance 3 being one of, if not the series best, so let's put that nostalgia to the test. How does Resistance 3 hold up close to a decade later, and is it worth your time revisiting or playing for the first time? Let's find out. Resistance 3's story is set four years after the events of Resistance 2, but we get a quick rundown on big events between the two games. Okay, so our new protagonist is Joseph Capelli, the last living member of the Sentinels after he killed Nathan Hale at the end of Resistance 2 because Hale had gone full Chimera. Seems like a rational decision, but somehow he's deemed a bad dude and dishonorably discharged from Serpa for his actions. On the plus side, Malakov discovered a cure from Hale's blood and manages to create a vaccine against the Chimera virus, which is helpful to all 10% of humanity who haven't been killed or converted by the Chimera. That's right, despite our past victories in Resistance 1 and 2, humanity overall has been getting its ass beat, and any humans left have resorted to hiding under ruins just trying to survive this bleak, chimera-dominated world, and just trying to maintain any sense of normalcy for as long as they can. Four years on, Joseph is now married to Susan Capelli, and they have a young son named Jack, and they're a part of a community of survivors hiding in an underground outpost in Haven, Oklahoma. Predictably, despite remaining hidden for all these years, once we take control, a Chimeran death squad has found our community, and despite managing to fight off the initial patrol, the Chimera managed to summon a massive terraformer to destroy the town. We soon learn though that the reason the Chimera found Haven in the first place was because they were following Malakov as he searched for Capelli. So understandably so, Capelli is pissed at Malakov for putting his life, his family's life, and this small community's life at risk, but it is for good reason. Malakov explains that when Hale detonated the bomb on Daedalus's ship, it created a wormhole in New York, and this wormhole has slowly been freezing Earth ever since. And it's gotten to a point where humanity will not survive another winter unless that wormhole is closed. 
Initially, Capelli doesn't care though, as he still has the threat of a terraformer destroying everything to worry about. But once we get all the community safely evacuated is when Capelli's wife, Susan, pleads with Joseph to go with Malikov, as Jack will not survive if the climate plummets any further. Capelli reluctantly agrees to help Malikov, so the two of them head off to New York City. And as we all know, New York is a hellhole! And you know how I feel about hellholes. Capelli and Malikov go on quite the adventure, starting off by needing to outrun a Goliath up the Mississippi River, making their way across St. Louis where they find a group of survivors known as the Remnants, which after we help secure a power core for their VTOL, the Remnant leader Charlie agrees to take us to New York. Capelli has a dream his family is in danger, and so Charlie agrees to check on them whilst Capelli falls from the VTOL on a mountain in Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania, we find another group of survivors, this time a religious community near a coal mine, and they need help killing a massive chimeran creature they call Satan, which we manage to do, get a train repaired, and we're back on track to New York. Whilst on the train though, we encounter the group known as Wardens, and these guys don't want our help. They're raiders or bandits, as any good apocalypse setting should have. The Wardens show off their ruthless intent quickly, as the train is derailed by feral Widowmakers, and Malakov is killed in front of us, and Capelli gets knocked out and captured. Capelli is now a prisoner and forced to fight in a gladiator-like game, but after we win, we are once again knocked out and put in a cell, which is where we are helped by a friendly warden, or slave, called Herbert. Herbert informs us that the prison is protected from being targeted by Chimeran forces due to a few modified Chimeran drones, and if we want any chance of getting out, we need to destroy those drones and start a riot. Which we do. The Chimera launch an attack on the prison, the prisoners are now free, and we got revenge for Malakov by ending Mick ourselves. We're free, but we're now on our own as Capelli finally reaches the frozen remains of New York. Capelli manages to find a working radio in which he broadcasts his farewell to his wife and son, saying that without Malakov, any chance of shutting down the tower is gone. We'll die trying though, as Capelli goes in solo to try and fight his way through New York, and get as close to the tower as possible, before he is ultimately cornered by the Chimera but is saved by Charlie in the VTOL at the last minute. Charlie tells Capelli he was sent to bring him back and doesn't want to hear anything about no suicide mission. Of course, Capelli ultimately convinces Charlie to go along with one last plan of attack. Disable the terraformer and make it crash into the New York Tower in the hopes of closing the wormhole. And that's just what they managed to do. Resistance 3 ends with Capelli reuniting with his family, and during the credits hearing numerous Resistance groups report across the globe of their success against the Chimera. Humanity may have finally won the war, and we can begin to rebuild. And that's the story for Resistance 3. I was truly captivated with Resistance 3's story to a point where I'd be hard pressed not to say it's my favourite story of the main series. First things first, Resistance 3 truly emphasises a resistance. Whilst we may have been on the back foot still in Fall of Man and 2, we were still a part of an army, and in that sense, the previous two games still felt like a war. That's not the case in Resistance 3. Joseph may be a soldier, but his fellow survivors are not, and that leaves the already dwindling sensation of hope to almost feel non-existent. We are a part of the final 10% of humanity, and boy does it feel like it. The world is bleak, each group of survivors around has their own pressing issues about to wipe them out. Earth is on the clock, and worst of all, the Chimera are more ruthless than ever. Malakov may have found the cure for the Chimera virus, but that just stopped them from trying to convert us into them. Now, all they want is for humanity to become extinct, and even though the next winter will wipe us out, it seems like that isn't soon enough because they are relentless. The Chimera are truly eerie this time around. 
I mean, just take our first encounter with them in Resistance 3. We're sneaking around trying to make no noise, and then bam, a member of our community is taken and killed right in front of us. You just get to see a totally different side to the Chimera this time around through survivors reactions and expressions and again it just makes the atmosphere so damn bleak. I love it. I think it was a good decision to center the story around surviving communities this time around as well. You get to see how different people are coping with near extinction. Whether it be focusing on simply hiding, religion, transport or chaos. It doesn't seem like a big deal but having these simple differences makes it feel like you're not just finding the same people over and over again. It's refreshing and I must say as well Resistance 3 got me to feel something twice in the campaign which caught me off guard. First of all the brutality in Malakov's death was infuriating and genuinely made me want to destroy the Wardens. And second is when Joseph is saying his farewells over the radio. Hope has left in his voice. He sees no way home, no way to see his loved ones again, and it's not even for anything as he believes they'll still end up dead. Again, I can't state this enough, Resistance 3's atmosphere and general bleak nature is something that really drew my attention and hooked me into a point where I was searching the environment for the intel to further expand this world. Unfortunately, as with anything, there is a few negatives that did bother me, such as, well, why exactly was Capelli vilified and dishonorably discharged from the army for killing a chimera? Or did he just not tell anyone? I know it was Hale, but we all saw him in Resistance 2. Everyone knew how that story was ending. It just doesn't make a whole heap of sense to me. I will also say, as much as I loved Capelli's goodbye message, I did not particularly care for his family because they just aren't in the game all that much. It makes sense that Capelli would care, but you have to understand that you need to make the player care too. And when you don't build a relationship, that's difficult. The story at times for this big cross-country adventure can feel a bit like a highlight reel of events as you don't spend a heap of time with anyone really and just teleport from location to location a bit too much. However, with that being said, overall the story was just a great experience. I adored the atmosphere, I loved the story structure and focus on the survivors and the change in direction for the Chimera is bleak dark and threatening, which is great for an antagonist. Yes, it's not perfect and I think if the game sat down for a little longer in certain locations to expand on characters and whatnot, that could have only made the story better. But on the whole, I love the way Insomniac decided to conclude their strange trilogy. Resistance 3 has the best gameplay of the series by far. It really does feel like a best of both worlds sort of game, incorporating what made Fall of Man a good time, mostly, still no vehicle segments, which I do miss, and the improvements made with Resistance 2, and telling the not so good parts to kick bricks. Firstly, thank goodness they re-implemented the weapon wheel. Its removal in Resistance 2 baffles me especially coming from Insomniac who make badass weapons, so to see it back here was such a relief. It just makes the gameplay better when you have access to all of these awesome weapons. It's like Insomniac is just telling us to have a good time. Mix it up without fear of getting stuck. You're encouraged to experiment and use every gun from the very beginning as well, since now in Resistance 3, all of these weapons level up the more you use them. No wacky or specific challenges, just use these weapons to do some damage to Chimera and they'll level up, which makes them more powerful along with adding more features to the guns. I loved this addition because it gets you to really think about what guns you use and when. For instance, when you come across the hordes of feral grims, you want a beefy shotgun, atomizer or cryo gun. So make sure you're using them so that they're leveled up when things get crazy later on. The level design is also much more open which allows us to make more decisions to suit whatever playstyle we may be going for to again upgrade your arsenal. 
These changes or re-additions make Resistance 3 feel by far the most replayable because it's tough to fully level up every weapon in one playthrough. So you want to see what else the weapons have to offer along with the levels feeling like they have the potential to be experienced in so many different ways. I should probably talk about weapon specifics though as well, it is a first person shooter. We've got the tried and true Bullseye, Carbine, Deadeye, Magnum, Auger, Marksman Rifle, Rossmore, mixed in with the new Mutator, Atomizer, Cryo Gun, Wildfire, and even a Sledgehammer, which doesn't level up, which is a shame, but still pretty cool. As I said before, not one of these weapons gets left behind. They all feel useful in given situations. You always want to mix it up to make sure your arsenal is getting better and better, and they feel great to use. The weapons have a good feeling of oomph about them, and they feel like they pack a punch just by the reaction or explosion of your enemies. It feels great. I think all the weapons are just so well designed and fun to use that I couldn't even pick a favorite. The bullseye and carbine are classics at this point, the Auger is a lifesaver, the Marksman Rifle does big damage quickly, the Magnum is great for hitting weak spots, the Deadeye Sniper feels so satisfying to use, the Rossmore, especially with fire shells, is great for the Horde, the Mutator, Atomizer and Cryo Gun are great for crowd control, and the Wildfire Rocket Launcher is a rocket launcher. It blows everything up. Again, I can't overstate the importance of the weapon wheel and weapon leveling system. You truly use every weapon as much as you possibly can and you never feel punished for trying something out of the ordinary. It's a system that makes for a great first person shooter experience. Now what I'm going to say next was a criticism in regards to the story, but is actually a positive in regards to gameplay. The campaign and journey from Oklahoma to New York City is an absolute highlight reel of events and you'll be going from mission to mission at a very brisk pace. This equates to the gameplay always mixing it up in some regard, whether it be fighting off waves of Chimera, using a new weapon you just picked up, fighting a Stalker or Widowmaker or Satan, outrunning a Goliath, trying to stop bandits from stealing our train, fighting in a gladiator arena, sneaking around mountainous terrain and picking off invisible Chimeran snipers, even playing some Half-Life 2 and Halo Reach-like moments in the mine town and New York. The game is always throwing new and varied locations, missions and set pieces your way and it makes for a great time to play through and again, these missions feel highly replayable. If I was to nitpick the gameplay, I do miss seeing and fighting all the different Chimera types. There is still some variety and the game does introduce new Chimera, but it just feels like a lot less and with Resistance 3 style of gameplay, I think it could have really benefited from having an absolute smorgasbord of enemies. I do think Resistance 3 would have been perfect to reintroduce vehicles, but maybe I was one of the few who enjoyed them in Fall of Man. The insect-like swarm enemies are a pain in the ass to deal with and their melee hitboxes are inconsistent to say the least. I would have liked a few more big boss enemies to take out since the Satan fight was this great long set piece and the Widowmaker fights are such a spectacle to be a part of, but we don't get much else other than fighting a dropship, the first stalker and a quick time event against Mick. I just like big boss fights and even if they just replaced one of the Widowmaker fights with another unique Chimera type would have scratched that itch. But again, these really do feel like nitpicks or even just a wish list of ideas which I think is the sign of a great game because overall, Resistance 3 is such a blast to play from start to finish. In my opinion, Resistance 3 is the best in the series, which I'm sure you've gathered by this point. When I looked back at the Resistance series before I started this series of retrospectives, this sort of experience was what I remembered so fondly. I loved the bleak atmosphere of this world. The new direction they take with the Chimera is genuinely unnerving. The story is simple, 
but the journey is captivating and the gameplay is refined and just a pure joy to play. I have a whole new appreciation for Resistance 3 now, which baffles me even more that it sold so poorly. A lot of people missed out on this great game and it holds up insanely well almost a decade later. Will we ever see a Resistance 4? I honestly have no idea, but I think the least this series deserves is a remaster for the newer consoles. A lot of the new PlayStation fans aren't familiar with this series, and they need to be. But if you could only play one game in this series, make sure it's Resistance 3. Thank you all so much for watching, I've had such a great time revisiting the main Resistance series, but that's going to be it for now. I'll get to Retribution and Burning Skies in the future, but not just yet. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to leave it a like because it helps let me know that you enjoyed yourself. Comment below your thoughts on Resistance 3 or the series in general, as well as any suggestions for games you want to see covered in the future. If you're new to the channel, make sure to subscribe. Go give my socials a follow if you fancy at Hair Bear, and I'll catch you all in the next video.